Hello, and welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam show for 2022. Hope you had a good Christmas and got what you wanted. I uh, got through all the Christmas and New Year's and so forth and ready to get back out to do whatever normal is, uh, whatever normal is now. Uh, but uh, today's show, we're going to start a kind of a new series, of, a day in the life, kind of give you an idea of what it was like to uh, be in Vietnam. Uh, each day, each day was a little bit different to a certain extent. And also, like uh, everything else with Vietnam, it depended on what year you were there, what unit you were assigned to, the location, and what your job was. Everybody's story is going to be a little bit different. We'll get into that. Some of the uh, uh, today we're going to be talking about a little bit about some of the wildlife and so forth. But uh, let me get you started here with the. Uh, uh, for, there we go. Uh, the Lessons of Vietnam show, uh, which you already know because you're here. Uh, we are trying to tell the real story of the uh, Vietnam War and the men and women who fought it. There's so many misconcepts and, and misunderstandings and lies and so forth out there. Uh, we're brought to you by Nissan Communications. Without uh, Amnon and Nissan Communications, we couldn't do this. So uh, we appreciate all his hard work to keep me straight and push the right buttons and so forth. I am your host, Bill Dixon. I was uh, in Vietnam, 1967, 68, doing a little thing called Tet. I was with the headquarters, headquarters company, 159 Engineer Group, which is part of the 20th Engineer Brigade. And we did a little bit of everything. We had our own asphalt plant, concrete plant, steel works. We did it all. Uh, during the show, uh, if you have any questions, what you want to ask, just call in. That number is 919. 518-9773, or go into Skype, and that is Computers 2K Voice, 2K Voice, and either ask a question, make a comment, or whatever. If after the show you want to send me a message or something, it's Dixon, D-I-X-O-N, Bill, B-I-L-L, 8-0 at yahoo.com. Send me your comments or whatever. Always uh, enjoy hearing what you got to say. And if you see something that you don't think is right, just let me know. And I'll see if I can get it straightened up for you. Now, the important part of the show, uh, to talk to you a little bit about the Veterans Crisis Line, if you are a veteran, you know a veteran, have a veteran in your family, and you feel like they're in crisis, having problems, please reach out to this number, 1-800-273-8255, and press 1. Press 1 will get you through to the, uh, a veteran's part, and it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, there's always somebody that's out there ready to talk to you. It's good to sometimes just have somebody to listen. That's out there. Now, Let's just talk about another day in the tropics. Uh, this is something I saw on Facebook, and I wanted to um, just stay in the tropics of Southeast Asia. I don't remember too many holidays while I was in Nam. Every day seemed to be run together. The longest days I had there were I, where I had to think. Thinking was a draining force and, and sapped the, uh, the want to write out of me. If I thought about home, I had a tendency to get anxious because home was a lifetime away back in the world. If I thought about the friends lost in this war, I had a tendency to get sad and then mad at every living thing walking the face of the earth. I could return home if I made it, but those who I called friend and were KIA could not, and it hurt like hell. No news was good news. And as life in the non progressed, it was damn. It was a damned if I do and damned if I don't. A snafu. There was no in between. Where peace of mind was concerned, Merry Christmas just wasn't happy. Thanksgiving not a chance. Survival could only hope. If you survived the day, there were the nights. On and on and on, but it wasn't. And that was a good example of, of what a day was like. Now, this first day I'm talking, we're going to be talking, to, we're going to be talking about 
is actually uh, the first day of um, after the war. Uh, the following translation is part of the book. Uh, and I'm not going to read that to you because I won't even come close, but it's Accepts of the Soldier uh, by Arthur Fan Hua, English translation, uh -huh. and Mr. Tran, that's his, uh, his the, whose father, it was an Arvin major, was killed on April 30th, 1975. Now, the officers and the enlisted men, both for the South Vietnamese, were uh, sent to the re-education camps. Uh, that's what they call them, but they were basically slave labor camps. They plowed under all of the cemeteries of South Vietnamese soldiers who had been killed during the war. Even today, they don't like for the, uh, anybody to bring over uh, money or goods for the uh, former South Vietnamese soldiers. This is going to be a story of the son of a, a former South Vietnamese soldier. It's going to give you a little bit of a, a insight on his, his day. Brother Thay was not fully two years old when the war ended, and I was born four years later. We are the generation that grew up after the war and bound by that war, sharing the same emotional link with it. Having read the draft that I had just completed, Brother Thay made an appointment to meet me. I have a story to tell, too. And today, inside a coffee shop, I kept silent through an afternoon listening to him. Around mid-March 1973, Mom took a bus to visit Dad at the battalion command unit station near the Cambodian border. Dad, Uncle Zhang, the deputy battalion commander, and three soldiers whose name Mom and uh, didn't know, walked out to welcome mom. Mom brought half a grilled pig as a, as a present. Looking at the grilled pig, dad smiled. Buying pig in an intense moment like this is for what? Brothers here have raised fish. Moreover, food is not a problem now. At that time in Saigon, there were, there were evacuations. Dad said, I know Saigon, Saigon is chaotic now. But you should be assured I will lead my men to return on time. Mom said, generals have fled one by one. You should go back. And Dad said, I can't leave my brothers at the moment. You better go home and take care of the kids and grandparents. I will be home later. When Dad said that sentence, Uncle Zong, who sat nearby, wept. Those sad, determined words like Dad's personality. Throughout the afternoon of April 30th, Mom was waiting for Dad to come home. By the evening, she hadn't seen Dad nor had any news of him. Around 8 p.m., Dad's chauffeur uh, appeared in front of the house. He kneeled down before Mom. They've already killed the Major, uttering that sentence. The chauffeur wept loudly. At the Trung Lap High School, you should go there and ask people, he told Mom, some further inf information. Then he went away. Since then, Mom hasn't heard from him. The following morning, Mom went to the Kuchi Trung Lap High Primary School, which was now used by a military management committee. Mom went to look for her husband's body, but didn't dare to say his name. Mom said vaguely that she was a soldier's wife. They pointed at a pit out in the rice paddies. The pit was so shattered that Mom used only her hands to scrape the dirt slightly. Then saw the dead bodies piled up together. Mom turned up one body after another. Dead wasn't here. Mom filled up the pit and went home. Two days later, Mom's dad borrowed a vehicle from the, uh, from the hospital's morgue. Going with Mom were Dad's parents, Uncle True, Uncle Tur, and her dad. Trooper officer asked the gorilla, telling the truth would help. Headstrong's evil killed them all. Men and villagers surrounded Dad's parents, cursing. Mom hid in the vehicle. 
Dad's mom talked to the gorillas. My son's name is Ren Nin Tur. Ah, that man was Tur, whose head was quite, who was quite tilted, wasn't it? On Dad's uniform, T.U. was embroidered. Dad's body lied in the pit next to the red pepper field. There were three corpses in the pit, already swollen. Dad's mom recognized her son lying, to, lying on top. Dad's dad wasn't sure if it was his son. Uncle Terrell walked to the vehicle calling mom. Mom recognized dad first by the t-shirt she had, uh, she had brought or bought. Dad was always wearing t-shirts. Like many men in the North, mom buried his, uh, buried his teeth right there with his beautiful teeth. On one leg, he wore a sock. The sock on the other leg was used to wrap his wrist. Mom unwrapped the sock and saw his wrist hanging by his hand by a tendon fiber. In his body, there were five bullets, one in the corner of his eye. After April 30th, the phantom was in hell. Grandma cried so much that her tears or glands were damaged. Grandpa looked bewildered and drank alcohol all day. It stopped caring about his life since his son's body was brought home. The grandparents had four sons. All of them enlisted in the army. The youngest uncle died of malaria in Dong Day. The eldest uncle served as a military medic who underwent re-education camp. He went home, got stuck, and committed suicide. The third uncle after re-education camp fled the country. He took care of his three children and 15 nieces and nephews. I forever remember those dollar notes inserted in toothpaste tubes he sent home. 20 people lived in the 40 square meter house of my dad's parents. Mom had to bring her three children to shelter at her parents' house. Mom's parents cleaned the pig shed behind the kitchen to make a room for the four of us. The room was enough for an iron bed and, and to cook meals. At four o'clock in the morning, Mom got up to grind soybeans and prepare ingredients for selling crab noodles. Mom sold crab noodles and soybean milk in front of Win Van Hock Hospital. Every day passed like that. For several decades, we lived and lived that way. A mother and three children slept on the iron bed. Some days we lied, Burdick lay. Well, hey, this is translate. Some days we lied vertically. Other days we lied horizontal. When lying horizontal, part of mom's legs protruded out of the bed. Mom paid for her children's studies as much as she could afford. I got a job as a worker. Uncle Tur sent money home for me to enroll in e evening English classes. In 1997, I read a recruitment announcement in a newspaper that were seeking staff to work at the Tansun Tansunut Airport in security, screening, and lugging, uh, luggage checking. I was qualified. I submitted my application. You're a trend done fee, aren't you? We inform you that you are qualified to work at Tonsonut Airport. Please show up on blank for, uh, for being trained and taking over the work. I rushed home, telling mom the news. She was cooking. She embraced me tightly and sobbed. I showed up and attended the training class. Every day when I came home, mom kept asking if there were any abnormalities. I didn't see any. Only one thing was that my classmate kept asking me how much it cost me to get in here. More than one week of training had passed, but mom wasn't assured yet. That night, she told me a few things about dad. Enough for me to feel numb. Mom and I stayed up all night long. In the mornings, dragging my bike, I said to mom, I will be okay, mom, if there is something wrong. They would not have accepted me before the begin from the beginning. My application had been submitted so long before I was called to work, which indicates they had received, reviewed it thoroughly. 
as I expected. I ranked number two when the training results were announced. I was assigned to work at the security screening section. I had my uniform made and a photo of myself taken for the ID card to be official. Having received the uniform, I wore it immediately. I cycled home like flying. Mama had just come home from the market. The bag in her hand seemed to fall on the ground as she saw her son in an aviation staff uniform. The entire family of mom's parents were surprised. Probably that there hadn't been any other moment in her life when mom had been so moved. She held me, tears falling from her eyes. Mom had said, may heaven bless us. And I started to work. I was extremely proud. My heart was filled with emotion every morning. From now on, I could help my mom. From now on, my family no longer would endure hardships. I had worked for almost two months. Two days would more would have been two months. Mr. Thay, we inform you that you will no longer be able to work at the airport. The, administra the administration staff gave me the de a decision note. The trend in Thay is not to be accepted to work from the date. It was because my dad was a combat officer in the old regime. Cycling home, I cried all the way. On the new road I just got used to. The road I had cycled so fast every time seemed to be so long today. Seeing me come home in the middle of the morning, mom perceived something had happened. She knew this day would come. Since I was offered the job, not a single day had passed that mom had not felt anxious. Dad, Dad took responsibility for the things he had done. Why did his son have to take responsibility? Why? Why didn't they review everything from the beginning? Why did they accept me to work for two months, then sack me? Why did they sack me? Mom said nothing, letting me cry. I was 24 years old then and trying to assert myself. Who was my dad? Whose shadow had affected my life so enormously until today? I had to know. To have peace of mind to keep going with my life. In my family's life, we still found it hard to afford, to afford daily meals. However, mom was willing to borrow to buy, buy me a computer and internet connection so that I could learn English. Half a day I worked in a coffee shop. The remaining time I spent learning English. Throughout that year, I constantly sought information about my dad. I read every article about dad's unit. I read so much that I learned about heart, the words that the men wrote about my dad, mentioning him in each of their memoirs. I gave this article to my mom. Mom said, this detail is correct. This detail is wrong. I found the email address of Dad's brothers in arms. I contacted them, one email by one email. I had the answers. Van Den Tur was born in 1943 in Hanoi at age 11. He followed his parents who migrated to the South and continued his studies at O. Macan Upper Secondary School. After graduating from the 14th class of reserve officers at the military academy, he served in the 32nd Ranger Group. In 1968, he was at the top of the military language course and was sent to the USA for a swamp, a swamp, a swamp ranger course in Kentucky. In February 1972, he was wounded while fighting in Laos. In the summer of 1972, he was captured on the bank of my twin river in Quang Tri, and became a POW, POW. Released in February of 1973, in late 1973, he commanded the Ranger 38th Battalion, 32nd Ranger Group. At noon on April 30th, Dad received the order of the Ranger Group commander. President Min, also known as Big Min, had surrendered and ordered us to stop marching on the spot. Awaiting the other side for the handover, the 33rd Ranger Group was to be dissolved. After exchanging with Captain Zong, Dead gathers the troops and, and 
stated clearly, who surrenders stay here with Captain's arm and wait for the handover? Who wants to keep fighting? Follow me. There were about 40 troops who followed dead, marching to Dong Du. Communications no longer existed, so dead didn't know that Dong Du had fallen on April 29th. Previously, Dead was an ordinary soldier who would fight when he told to do so. Dead had changed since he was arrested and released. After his release for six months, he had shown up. He had to show up at his unit, write a report, and be interrogated. They were afraid that Dead had been brainwashed during his imprisonment. His record showed he was a northern man, which constituted a foundation for suspicion. When he returned to combat, he fought determinedly. Mom said Dad wanted to prove his loyalty. Dad said to Mom, we left the North to come here. If we don't protect the South, where will we live? Dad led his men to Dongnu. Marching across the guerrilla village, it ended there. One day, I suddenly asked Mom, long time ago, you came to claim Dad's body. I remember the detail of your scraping earth to see those men. Why didn't you alert their families so they could do the same? I don't know where they were to show them. At the time, I only expected to find your dead's body without having the ability to do it for the remaining soldiers. Let me go up there and find them. Are you crazy? To dig up that story for what? You return there for what? Perhaps they'll arrest you. Mom, co Mom covered the pit with dirt and went home. The store was closed. The store had been closed for 36 years. Until 2011, one noon while surfing the internet, I read a message looking for lost soldiers. My family is looking for news of a brother named Lei Van Huh? Soldier number 747428, 1st Platoon, 30th Ranger Battalion, 32nd Ranger Group, missing while retreating from Tainin. I was anxious. After thinking for a long time, I showed Mom the message. That's Uncle Ty. And he was dead as signaler, which would be radio man. Pausing for a while, Mama said, if you find their homes, let them know so they can find the place. The first location is Trung Lap Park School, then a junction of three dirt roads, red paper, red pepper field on the left, rice fields on the right. I'm afraid that people may have built homes there, so finding them is impossible. I decided to contact Mrs. Hong, who, who posted the message. I rode my motorbike to Kuchi. I stood still for a long time in front of Trung Hollow Primary School. I looked deep into the schoolyard. A strong wind blowing dust in my face woke me. I entered a drink shop nearby and sat down, calming myself. Do you know a mass grave near here? Before the shop owner could answer me, two guests sitting at the next table turned around and asked me. Those soldiers were tiger patches on their shoulder. Each of the villas here knows about that. I was startled. The guests went on. My house is next to Uncle Bazaar, who owns the field in which the grave is located. I could hardly say anything when a female fruit vendor passed by, stopped her cart to enter the shop pulled up a chair to sit and said cautiously, the mass grave is, a is of tiger soldiers who were said to retreat from Tainan to here and were ambushed. That day was the last fight. There were no more after that. Before it was an anti-tank trench, local villagers dragged those bodies down there and backfilled slightly. One rainy afternoon, people walked out and there and found arms and legs exposed. They had to stop to hoe soil to fill it up. Later, it evolved into a grave. The two guests climbed on their motorcycles and left. The fruit vendor pushed her cart away, leaving me behind bewildered. The shop owner now answered my question. That's correct. Those ranger troops were arrested on Route 2. All his instructions are walked out to the field of Mr. Of Mr. Murai. I came to Uncle Murray's house asking him about the grave. Murray said, I grow rice, but don't dare to grow it on the grave. Buffalo herders don't walk by. 
Cows and buffaloes are not allowed to come here. On full moon days or Tet, I always buy offerings for these men and wish them their families to come and bring them home. I want to know about the grave. About what happened that day, you can ask Mr. Utt, who witnessed it from the beginning to the end. I didn't. Uncle Murray showed me the first way to Uncle Utt's house. I didn't dare to meet Uncle Utt immediately. Having a full day of much emotion, I had to return to Saigon to calm down. I would go back down the next day. Uncle Utt was then a local gorilla of DC. Being a local gorilla, he would, uh, would he tell me the story even though it happened 36 years ago? I stayed anxious, ang- anxious all night. I decided not to disclose my background, going to meet Uncle Uck. Uncle Uck walked out of his house looking still sleepy and tired. That's right, there's a pit, but I no longer remember anything. I invited him to the coffee shop. I introduced him to that. I introduced to him that I was an acquaintance of the soldiers who wanted to uh, be expatri- expatriated their bodies. I suggested it was said that their loved ones died in this area after retreating from Dainin. Uncle Up tapped his hand on his forehead, uttering, That's right. That's right. I remember now. A big, handsome major led that army wing. I do remember because he spoke with a northern accent. Girls from many areas concentrated to counter that unit. When the guerrillas deployed their men for an ambush, the army wing, consisted of about 40 troops, was besieged. Guerrillas used a loudspeaker to call for surrender. Those men didn't surrender but fired their guns. They decided to fight. The fighting went on for an hour and a half. Excuse me, half an hour. But both sides suffered heavy losses. Then the guns fell silent. The guerrillas kept on calling for a surrender, telling that Dongdu had fallen. If not surrendered, they would deploy tanks and destroy the unit. There were no answers from the soldiers. The guerrillas found out the unit had run out of ammunition and were exhausted. Only 13 men were left. Throwing out with 40. I closed my eyes, swallowed each of, the, of his words. It was, very, it was the very thing that I was seeking. Only 13 men left. The battalion commander major, the signaler, the gray-haired school, uh, second lieutenant, and 10 soldiers. All of them were led to Trung Lop High Primary School. I and some men guarded them. At the time, a, a quarrel occurred between the guerrillas and the major. The major threw a cigarette pack at the guerrilla commander. The major's attitude seemed challenging. Seeing that, I said, now comes liberation. They gallant and a little and a little bit, gentlemen. After a while, some guerrillas entered for a consultation. When it was done, they walked out, and a group of guerrillas led the major to the red paper field. The other group used fishing lines to tie the arms and legs of the twelve soldiers. I decided to stop the story and went home. Why well, wanted to cry? Upon arriving in Saigon, I approved. I provided further information to my mom, hoping that she could recall anything. On the next day, I came back to Kuchi, back and forth for several rounds, feeling everything could be a start. I informed Mr. Hung. Mr. Hung had and Uncle Tai's younger brother went with me to Kuchi. Uncle Ut uttered when seeing Uncle Tai's brother, so lot alike, like the signaler of the major. He told us more about the signal. The soldier who carried the signal had a white, a white compression and sat in silence with his head down for the entire session. We walked out to the field, burning incense, discussing the, uh, the examination, asking Ung Ut to look after everything, resting and having meals at the house of Uncle Ut. Uncle Ut agreeing to help with all the work. He would contact the commune committee, and find excavation workers. On the chosen date, we all went down to Gucci to carry out the work. Uncle Ut had prepared the offering. I tried to contain my emotions, seeing Uncle Ut knee down, knee down before the grave, arranging the offerings and burning incense. 
working men scraped the hay, started an exhumation. Each of the hoes they touched ground hurt my heart. When a working man said coming next was bones, I felt so frozen in the heat of the sun. Everything was dug up, a long leg bone with an intact sock, a belt made of parachute cloth, a tying rope made of green fishing line. Unable to contain my heart, I let my tears fall. Uncle Ut stood behind, tapping slightly on my shoulder. I woke up. I saw Uncle Ut shed his tears many times. I lit a cigarette asking him, trying to keep my voice calm. What were those people wearing when they were shot by the gorillas? There were so many people at that time, I recall that some wore shorts, others wore soldiers' trousers, and others with pants were popless. I turned to look back. There were 30 to 40 people looking on from where and out from whom I didn't know. They were talking noisily. There were laments. There were curses. Some said additional things which I won't sure if they were true or not, and others swept their tears. Workers continued their excavation. A piece of paper, mobilization decision, a wound medal, a dog tag, an ID card, a nylon bag containing a palm of of oil uh, containing a palm oil a bottle, two crosses, a toothbrush, a pen, a wallet with a photo of a soldier with a girl whose face was not clear, a watch, a wristwatch. Its strap was made of black leather. I picked up the watch and ran to uh, to the canal to wash it. An O was seen. I guessed it was small. It was Omega. Those numbers were seen clearly. Two hands remain intact. The hand showed four hours and 14 minutes, dated the 31st. My heart stood still. April 1975 didn't have the 31st date. The watch owner died before he could adjust the date. His hands continued to winding for 24 hours and stopped, or when the body collapsed, the watch contacted water and stopped working. I pressed the watch to my heart. I turned mad. In my head, I visualized the moment these men died. I cried, calling my dad's name in my mind. I sobbed, and I sobbed so much that I didn't know what I could now sob for. My dad had the other way to go home, safely with his wife and children. But no, he never said com compromise, let alone, let alone surrender. These soldiers wouldn't have died if my dad had surrendered. They died for my dad's ideology. They died for loyalty. For a long time, I had lived in soul-searching responsibility. I felt dead all around. I felt dead was all around. I felt as if I were in the same unit as theirs. I'm thinking of the number 13 in whatever I do, offering 13 bowls of rice, burning 13 incense sticks. I no longer bear a heavy heart about the incident at Tonsonood Airport. If it weren't for that, my dad's image would have disappeared. What happened led me to find my dad. It took me 10 years to understand my dad. After that, my life turned to a different phase. I cared about my family. I didn't think of much of my dad. I looked for wounded veterans helping them. One week ago, I went down to Coochie to visit Uncle Ut and Auntie Saul. Auntie Saul was the fruit vendor who passed the, uh, by the drink shop. Uncle Ut was glad to see me. It's been 10 years. Did you ever say that you are dead to a dead to son? I won't. Speaking out can be better, but let it be. I don't want Uncle Art to think of anything more, and that is, and it, that doesn't matter anymore. That kind of gives you an idea of what it was like to be uh, the family of a former South Vietnamese soldier. Uh, they basically didn't exist, uh, buried in mass graves and so forth. Now we're going to get into some of the stories by some of the soldiers there. Um, I got a lot of these from uh, some of the websites in, uh, in, on Facebook uh, where the soldiers themselves spoke. RB says, a, full, a flight full of survivor's guilt and likely other psycho-emotional challenges that will be labeled PTSD. The real surprise will be non-existent public welcome. Many were cursed, spit at, and called baby killers. For those returned to healthy, loving families, adjustment was easier than those that came home 
from who came from broken homes as I did. Many, too many weren't able to adjust and end the life that survived the war. Fortunately, I turned to a faith in God's love imparted to me by a chaplain while in juvenile hall at age 12. God loves me. God loves his creation so much that he made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Just we could join him in heaven. Because if you acknowledge and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What the heart a person believes results in a, his justification and with the mouth he acknowledges and confesses resulting in and confirming his salvation. Doc K says, We were men, weren't we? We were tough badasses, weren't we? We walked like men and talked like men. Every word was blank, and we used that word for every particular uh, particle of speech, nouns, verbs, questions, explanations, all of them. We kicked ass. Yes, we're all those things until we ran across the dog. Then, boy, that was still deep inside of us came to the surface. Once again, we were home. Once again, we had someone we could talk to and confess all our fears and worries. Once again, we had someone who gave us an excuse to such an unmanly world, love. It felt so good to hold one, to talk to one, to pet one. It kept us human and sharpen our desire to get back home alive. I remember one mission when we had a canine and his handler. When we set up at night, everyone crowded around and just petted the dog. You can see all those hardcore feelings just kind of melting away. Then when I got back to the rear, I adopted speed. Sure, it was a mutt, but a mutt with a lineage. His mother and grandmother all resided with the aid station at Fubai. Speed went with me and 91 Charlie Mack back to the aid station or on, face, on Firebase Arsenal. He was pretty much my dog while I was there, and after I left, Mack and 91 Charlie took over responsibility. He was a sweet little but tough puppy. Of course, the life was all thought he was, he was speedy, but Mack and I knew better. He certainly helped me through the final months of my tour, and I was somewhat heartened that Mack took over for me after I left. Didn't Mama Sama take him home? But I had always wondered what became of him after that. I'm saddened to think his life may not have been as full as I would have liked. But I always felt good that he had a lot more love and attention than he might have had had we not taken him in. Anyone else having memories of dogs in Vietnam? Okay. This is a poster. Lost Cobra. Vietnam had more than its share of deadly snakes, and they could not, and they did not pick sides. They were dangerous to both armies. I'll talk a little bit about snakes. So. I didn't encounter many snakes as a crew chief, door gunner on a medevac, but but do one day with a dead huge viper. We were to evacuate a snake bitten grunt of the second and eighth from Brown. Uh, Brown from blown LZ from a blown LZ in the jungle. We had loaded him on board and were ready to take when the head and part of the torso of said offender landed in my lap. Good thing I didn't wear underwear. Forty-nine years later, I ran into the lieutenant who tossed it at me. I had cooled off by then. And I got his attention. FR. In 71, I was on guard at the bridge at Fula. And the kids liked to come there to swim. One day, some kids got my attention to something in the river that had them all scared. It was a giant water snake, and they wanted me to shoot it. So I aimed and shot it in the head. The kids were so happy, and I became their best friend. And BS says, walk in point one day and look down the trail and see a cobra looking back at me. We were maybe 40 to 50 feet apart. His head looked to be about waist high off the ground. I hollered the column and just waited until it moved off the trail. Wasn't going to challenge that big boy. Had other occasions when a snake of some kind slivered over me one night. Just about scared the crap out of me. BP says, long day in i core. Set up for the night. Fixed the watch sequences and crashed in some bushes. Look when I felt something gasp, grasping my hair. 
I snapped up from my waist, wheeled around, and pointed a rifle at it. It hissed. I calmly explained that I was not dead. I appreciated its interest, but was not food today. It hissed again. Less fear in the hiss, so I assumed we were in agreement. I went back to sleep and moved on to another potential, uh, and, and it uh, moved on to a potential food source. Life in the woods west of way on the, west, on the, on the road to the Ashaw Valley. DM says, we had a pet python live in the walls of the Rex Hotel in Saigon, near our photo darkroom in 68 and 69. Only saw it a few times, but we had no problems with rodents. And the rats were numerous. K.A. We're taking a break from humping and sitting back to back against our rugs. Under some foliage when Trick says, Doc, what's a bamboo pit biker look like? I say, two to three foot long, pale green, skinny, about 30 seconds go by. Trick jumps up out of his rock, machete hand trailing away, leaves are falling everywhere. He holds up the machete with the snake hanging over it. Is this one I was right over our head? It was right over our head. It was, and I hate snakes. That's what we call two-step, green snake. EC says, was picking up a part in the supply yard at Tonsonoo, standing next to a forklift, raising a pallet, and as it went up, so did the cobra that was under it. The operator dropped the pallet and its load back on the snake, and I returned to the hooch to change my drawers. You know, they were everywhere, huh? BK says, call it baby cobra at Dongtown. Took it to the berm, and two of us emptied two sawed off M2 carbines, 30 round mags on full alto, into where we set it loose in the grass and never found a piece of it. Retreated backwards out of the grass, hoot sweet. MG says, a board tin can off the North Vietnamese coast near Dong Ha. The water was often alive with venomous snakes, sea snakes. Sometimes it looked like minestrone, soup. No swim call in those shallow waters for sure. I had a helicopter pilot tell me one time, or a medic, that sometimes they went out to uh, get down pilots and they saw the, where the pilot landed in the water and there was sea snakes completely all cir circling around. There was nothing they could do. J.M. Jr., my first week on base at Udorn, someone killed a cobra that was under our hooch. Wow, don't like snakes. D.P., my snake's not about a cobra, but something more python lot. I served with E. Recon, 1st and 7th, 1st Air Cav Division, fairly briefly in a post-Cambodian part of 1970 and early 1971. It was one of those fairly quiet pauses in the war. We had blood of the enemy, but he knew he was winning the propaganda war, and for that moment seemed to be waiting, as many of us were, for us to withdraw. A lot of our time was spent looking for caches of weapons. Colonel Leverus used his large, largely to find, us largely to find out what he couldn't otherwise know from the air. We were his eyes and ears. On the ground, often that simply meant being sent into the jungle where Chopper couldn't uh, see much. There was one long patrol that I doubt any of us ever forgot, though we never saw the enemy. It, star it starred everything else, a tiger, monkeys, our LT stomach pain that turned into, into a medevac for appendicitis. But I'm only here to tell a snake story that no one else in the platoon ever noticed. They encountered the wildlife there, the monkeys, the snakes, uh, uh, tigers. RK, our company was on a mission during dry season. Not sure where we were. We had a little water and a few guys had heat stroke. and had to be dusted off. It was like walking an ashtray. They finally stopped to get a big rubber container of water dropped in and some supplies. I spent the night sleeping in a small depression on the ground after pulling guard duty. Woke up the next day and picked up my poncho and gear that I was sleeping on. A very large snake was beneath me and slithered away into, into the hole. It must have been in the mud further in the ground and attracted to the warmth of my body. I'll never forget it. J. 
J.M. I saw a snake slither across my lieutenant's chest in the middle of the night as he slept. I thought it best not to wake him. I told him the next morning about the snake. Okay, MD says, early on in the tour, we had gone out on a patrol and set up an ambush site with the standard perimeter just off the trail. It was a moonless night. A slow rain was coming down with me on watch back into the bush. I felt something slither up over my poncho and covered, and covered leg and then up into the other leg. It seemed like it took forever for it to cross over me. The scream was caught in my throat the whole time as I was afraid the noise of me doing so would give away our location. The only thing I can figure is that it was a large snake and that because of the wet, cold poncho covering my legs, it didn't detect my body heat. Thank God. I was so scared I took the next man's watch as there was no sleep for me. Don't like snakes to this day. Now you think about it. It's pouring down, raining. It's dark, no moon. You can't even see your hand in front of your face. And something slithers across you. KL says, we stopped on patrol and took off my boots and soaked my feet in a cool mountain stream near a contoon. A guy across from me raised his rifle and aimed at me. I was again leaning against a fallen tree about that time. Something started bumping against my shoulder. Then it slithered around and stared me in the face. Another guy came up behind me and took the cut and took out took it out with a machete as the color of it drained out of my tanned face. It was about five feet long and two-tone lime green and yellow. RB. Went to the mess hall. Walk in and the mess sergeant shot a cobra about three feet away from me. Not sure what I did with him. MM says, I had gotten bit by a rat near Doc Toe in November 67. At that time, two others on our, our fire support base had been getting rabies shots. One guy was nine days into his two weeks course of shots, and another guy was three days. The serum had to be chopped in each day due to lack of refrigeration. But due to heavy fire from NBA reckless, we could not get choppers in for two days in a row. They made these guys start the course of shots over again. I said to myself, no way. So I told another sergeant I had, been, I had been bitten and I was not going to undergo the rabies shot treatment. I told him there was only one, I was the only one that knew that I had been bitten and, and I shouldn't start to foam. And if I should start to foam with the mouth or anything, he could then tell commander that Sergeant McCon got bit by a freaking rat. I was damn scared, but made it through the incident. BH. Where, where was it ever scarce of rats in Vietnam? Me. Everywhere I went in country, they were everywhere. A friend was sitting on a bunker on watch. He felt something hit him in the back. Thought someone was messing with him. After the second or third time, he got up and used his red flashlight and saw the big cobra standing there. Well, he emptied 30 rounds in that snake and the entire perimeter opened up. Well, I bet that was, that was a hell to pay then because everybody started shooting. MN says, in Chula, at our tiny compound near the sea, we had bright colored big lizards. JR, I was a young uh, lieutenant pat platoon leader. On patrol, one day, our point man hit a tripwire grenade and got a light shrapnel wound after we dusted him out. I saw a lot of eyes wondering who the LT is going to assign as point man. Fort Benning training kicked in, and I said, I'll take point. Got about 500 meters along a rice dike, very slowly, when I felt a movement under my foot. I dived into a fifth rice paddy, as did eight other guys. After no explosion, one of the guys whacked a four-foot snake with a machete. Here's your trophy, Lieutenant, one of the other guys said. He'd take point because we wanted to get back to the location before dark. Fifty years later, I still hate snakes. 
At least it wasn't mine. TC in the Ashaw Valley, 1969. I never got to see any shows. Just blood, guts, and an awful smell of death and napalm like rotten eggs. As we went, of course, everybody had to have have a lighter. Uh, this one says uh, Vietnam seventy one seventy two. We the unwilling, led by the unqualified, to kill the unfortunate, die for the ungrateful. And the other one says, "When I die, I know I'm going to heaven because I spent my time in hell." And then another thing that was day to day. There were not many flush toilets around. Uh, so uh, the human waste went into these barrels, and every day somebody had to pull these barrels out, put diesel fuel in there, and stir it up and burn it. Uh, crap burning detail. Sometimes it was used for punishment, and sometimes it was just because it had to be done. Uh, even the rivers and creeks had the special challenges. Uh, crossing, as you can see, the one guy, that, that creek was a little bit over the guy's head, but he didn't want to get his, um, his rifle wet. So he's kind of, I hope he's going to hold his breath a long time. Uh, you see me there in that picture. Uh, I'm trying to fill up my canteen. And then the bottom of that, you see a little leech. Uh, if the water was not moving fast, which in most water wasn't, uh, you uh, had to put up with the leeches. Now, uh, it was not un uncommon to have multiple leeches on you uh, at the time because uh, I saw areas that the entire ground was moving with leeches. So that was another little challenge of the day today. I, I love the advertisement they say. If your earplugs didn't do the job they were supposed to be for the Iraqi and Afghanistan soldiers, and I'm looking at this picture, earplugs? What earplugs? I don't know of anybody in Vietnam that had earplugs. I'm certain there's some out there, but you can see they got the hands over the ears or the ears, the fingers stuck in the ears. Uh, the artillery guys. Uh, everybody I know in, from Vietnam has tendonitis. Ringing in the ears. Another good thing. I love this one. It has been said the most dangerous thing in the military is a second lieutenant with a map and a compass. As you can see, the sergeant leading the private along. We're not going to get lost. I've been leaving a trail of breadcrumbs. Of course, you can see the lieutenant with a mouthful of breadcrumbs. He's been eating them as they go. And, uh, now, I hope this doesn't offend anybody, but this is Vietnam. The most functional English word is shit. That's right, shit. You can smoke shit. You can get shit faced. Buy shit. Sell shit. Lose shit. Find shit. Tell people to eat shit. Forget shit. Some people know they're shit and some have shit for brain. There's crazy shit. There's bullshit. Horse shit. Chicken shit. Deep shit. Wrong shit. The right shit. And not enough shit. Weird shit. Scary shit. No shit creek or up shit creek without a paddle. And sometimes everything you touch turns to shit. You could pass this on if you gave, if you give a, um, a hoop a shit or not. If you don't give give a shit, hope you had a shit a shit free weekend. Uh, shit and the other word we talked about a while ago was in every sentence. Uh, there was not a complete sentence unless those two words were in. Uh, as you can see, during the rainy season, everything turned to mud. Deep clinging mud could be a challenge. It was also good for the trench rod of the feet. The boots were made uh, so that they drained water out, which also means they could drain water in. There were uh, canvas uh, sides and it had uh, holes in them to let the water drain out. So at least you, you were not walking, sloshing in the water too bad all day. But then your socks, you wore socks, uh, were still wet all day. And not many people in the field wore underwear because you'd end up with all kinds of problems. Even church was a challenge. As you can see there, a makeshift church with the chaplain uh, standing in front of an APC, armored personnel carrier, who's got the shelf there where he's got uh, the altar. Um, just another day, just another day in the Nam for church. As you can see there, these guys are living in, living in sandbags down in the hole. Uh, you can see their uniforms a little bit dirty. Uh, there ain't a whole lot of places to change clothes or get a shower often out there. So uh, the grunts out in the field, uh, they probably never get those uniforms back to being green again. Now, this was an interesting story. Let me see how I'm doing on time. 
I got, I think I got enough time to pass it. This is a true story. This is a true story of a man who actually fought in Vietnam for his friend. What started as a simple plan between old friends to help one get out of deploying to Vietnam resulted in a case of mistaken identity that took decades to unravel. When Paul switched places with his drafted friend, Frank, they hoped it would result in a quick discharge. Instead, Paul was shipped off to Vietnam. As Frank, when he spent more than a year impersonating an army soldier. So Paul ended up being sent to Vietnam because everybody thought he was Frank. The two men grew up together in northern New York, New Jersey, enjoying a childhood history of youthful scrapes, including a wrestling match that left Paul with a metal pin in his arm. That would, pin would provide decisive of both of them their fate. After the families moved, the two drifted apart. Though they still kept tabs on each other, Paul eventually dropped out of high school and, and tried to enlist in the Army in 1965. Even though the Vietnam War was starting to involve large numbers of American troops in bloody combat, he was rejected because of the pin in his arm. He bounced around various jobs in Pittsburgh and New Jersey while attending, attending his old Frank's wedding along the way. In 1966, Frank was drafted and things took a surreal turn. Frank showed up at Paul's boarding house in New Jersey in uniform informing him that he was AWOL. He couldn't bring himself to leave his wife and was scared about what would happen to him in Vietnam. The two of them came up with a plan that seemed ingenious and simple. Frank showed up at Paul's boarding house in New Jersey in uniform. Okay. After Alden Frank's records, they have Paul's height and weight recorded. Paul would report to Fort Dix pretending to be Frank and say he lost his military identification. He would then draw attention to the metal pin in his arm and use that to get a medical discharge. Frank would be off the hook. Sounding good. At first, all went well. Paul was accepted at end processing as Frank and given a new identification card. But then Paul found himself being shuffled into a C-141 on the tarmac of McGuire Air Force Base after being handed a pack of cigarettes. So began his journey to Vietnam, a journey that would last 406 days without the slightest bit of military training. Paul continued to play along, however terrified he must have been. After being assigned to the 25th Infantry Division, he attended a short five-day field orientation course with other replacements, but he did get some training. After the course, he was assigned to Alpha Company, 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry Regiment, or the Wolfhounds, which had, been, which had seen some ferocious fighting, ultimately leading to the award of two medals of honor. His platoon was known as the Dead Men's Platoon because of the casualties it suffered. Untrained Paul. Paul leaned heavily on his squad leader and his fellow soldiers to learn everything he was supposed to already have known. His unit was soon sent to the Iron Triangle northeast of Kuchi, enemy territory infested with booby traps and tunnels hidden in a dense jungle. Soldier after soldier, he knew fell victim to landmines and improvised explosives. You can see the picture of the tunnel there. Paul provided adept as a tunnel rat. Later in his memoirs, he wrote, the words are easily enough to remember. The lieutenant wants someone to go down in the tunnel. The plume had plenty of volunteers. I was just one of many. But why did I choose to go? I wondered my self-imposed new identity wouldn't accept ignoring the lieutenant's invitation. One such claustrophobic excursion rapidly descended into the forest. Worming his way into the tunnel with a 45 and a flashlight, Expecting booby traps at every turn, Paul nearly sold himself in a god awful noise. Charlie must have, had, must have heard me entering his home. He let a little surprised. He left me a little surprised and slowed me down. Two feet, of, uh, two feet in front of him was a very upset chicken. Paul performed very well as a soldier despite his unorthodox beginnings. Being promoted to sergeant in the fastest time possible, he ended up extending his time in the field 
so he would be discharged as soon as his tour was over. Now, you may think a chicken's not that scary, but if you're in a dark tunnel, not knowing what's there, a chicken squeeching, uh, well, you try it. After Paul made it back in New Jersey, he met with Frank to begin re reassuming his identity. We reversed ourselves. In 1966, Frank taught me all he knew about the Army of Fort Dix, New Jersey, and Fort Polk, Louisiana. I was now teaching him about the Army in Vietnam in 1967. The gulf between the two friends became too big to bridge, and after the switch, they swiftly departed. In 1981, Paul became nostalgic for his old unit and identity, identity as a soldier and attempted to contact the media for help in clearing up the mess with the Army. This was to take over a decade of frustration. After several media appearances, he was told his claim would be investigated by the Board of Corrections of Military Records in 1991, a slow process in an Army bureaucracy already notorious for its inertia. After waiting for two years, the Army confirmed that he had indeed served in Vietnam as somebody else. On November 24, 1993, a board met and determined that Paul should be given an official military file and an honorable discharge. As a Vietnam veteran, he was official. Paul continued to meet with his old members of his unit who had supported him in his quest until his death on September 21, 2004. He may have served as Sergeant Frank. But to his friends and for everyone else who knew him, he was Sergeant Paul. Now that's that's a little bit different than your average so uh, your average uh, day soldier, uh, but I thought it was unique enough to add it to. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Our next class, our uh, story show, whatever you want to call it, a little bit of all of it. I hope it will be February fourteenth, Valentine's Day. So don't have to worry about getting me a Valentine. Just show up with your friends and enjoy the show. If you have any questions and so forth, and if you are a veteran who would like to uh, be on the show and tell your story, it doesn't make any difference if you were a crap burner or you were a Medal of Honor winner. I'd like to have you on the show. If you were a war protester, I'd like to have you on the show because uh, I want to get the full story. But again, thank you for tuning in. Remember that you can go back to, uh, to Nissan Communications and pick up some of the past shows we've had. Go see some of the other shows. I think you'll enjoy them. Uh, you have a great, wonderful January, and looking forward to seeing you in February. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. If you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it in the archives section at nissancommunications.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter, and like us on Facebook. Sponsored by StreamingGear.com, Carolina Apparel, and DeltaForce.net.